to American National Government, Lecture 1, Western Civilization. I call this lecture a flyover of Western Civilization. We'll look at the Jewish, Greek, and Christian influence on the West and its eventual spread to the British colonies in North America. We're covering a lot of territory, philosophy, history, even a little art, but today I just want you to listen. Western civilization is the culture of societies in Europe and North America as opposed to Asia or, in modern history, communist Eastern Europe. Its three major influences are Jewish, Greek, and Christian. The Jews taught the West that the world was created and is ruled by one God, that mankind is a brotherhood, and through Moses, God gave his perfect law to the nation of Israel, which teaches men to act justly. Jewish monotheism is the belief in one God, who is worthy of worship as the creator and ruler of the world. Our timeline starts with Adam and Eve in about 4004 BC. Hopefully most of you already know the creation account in Genesis. If not, here's the quick hits. Creation, completed in six days. Man, first man Adam and his wife Eve. The fall, this is when sin entered the world. From the Jews, we learn humans are social. God says it's not good for man to be alone, and so he organized them into families, one man and one woman, which is still the smallest unit in societies, and that all men are born sinners as a result of the fall. Next, the brotherhood of mankind starts with Father Abraham had many sons, well, actually only two and a promise from God that his chosen people would come through Abraham's bloodline. Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael is the son of Hagar, the father of the Arab nations, and Isaac is the promised son, and is the father of Esau and Jacob. Jacob wrestled with God, lived through it, and was renamed Israel. His 12 sons make up the tribes of Israel. Jacob's youngest son, Joseph, was sold into slavery by his brothers. Eventually, all of Israel was enslaved in Egypt. Here's where we meet up with Moses, born around 1526 BC. This is Israel's great salvation story. Moses led his people out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, and eventually into the Promised Land. The Ten Commandments were given to Moses by God on Mount Sinai to teach Israel to be holy, because God is holy. God chose Israel to be his own people, but they would have to learn through the law to be holy in order to be in relationship with him. God's laws are perfect and above human-made law. Jewish history continues with the kingdom's exile and return of God's people to their promised land. This happens from 1050 BC to about 445 BC, and their story is told in the Old Testament. Now, the ancient Greeks were the first to think clearly. Rationalism is the belief that reason and knowledge, rather than emotion, should rule the actions of man. Always good advice. I want to introduce you to three Greek philosophers whose teachings still shape Western thoughts. The first is Socrates, born around 469 BC in Athens. He was the greatest influencer on Western thought from the ancient world, and like Jesus, never wrote a single line. We know Socrates from the writings of his student, Plato. Now, the Socratic method is asking questions to discover truth. So, can asking questions reveal truth? Well, imagine for a moment that you come home hours past curfew. What's the first thing your parents are going to do? I bet they'll be asking questions. But I must warn you, the pursuit of truth is dangerous. Socrates was executed by opponents of the truth. Before he drank the poison, he offered one more lesson. He said, the unexamined life is not worth living. Plato was born around 427 BC and was a student of Socrates, and he founded the Academy in Athens. The Republic is his greatest work. We meet Socrates in this book and learn of his thoughts about government. It's an excellent introduction to the basic issues that confront humans as citizens. Bottom line, Plato thinks a philosopher king is best. This is ruled by the ideal man, a man who loves knowledge and has wisdom. And Aristotle was born around 384 BC. He was an absolute genius. A student of Plato, he tutored Alexander the Great and founded the Lyceum in Athens. His book, Politics, is the starting point for all study of political science. He even invented comparative politics. 
So Plato dealt with ideals and Aristotle dealt in the what's possible. His top three governments in order of preference, monarchy, aristocracy, and constitutional government, probably because it's the most workable. And Aristotle cautions us to watch out for the degenerate forms of these governments. This is the bad news. Monarchies can quickly turn into tyrannies. Think King George III, at least from the colonist viewpoint. Aristocracies can turn into oligarchies or rule by the powerful few. And the worst news for democracy-loving Americans, constitutional governments can devolve into democracies, or rather, as Aristotle considered them, rule by the poor, where the mob finds it can vote themselves benefits, and that means other people's property. Don't worry about all these types of government today. We'll dig deeper into them next time. Now, all roads lead to Rome. This is a sculpture of the brothers Romulus and Remus, who were raised by a wolf. Romulus kills Remus and founds his city, Rome. The Roman Republic is dated from 509 BC to 27 BC. A republic is a state in which the people and their elected representatives hold supreme power and are ruled by law. In 509 BC, King Tarquin was driven out of Rome, and in his place, Rome established a balanced constitution. It had a monarchy, the leader was called the dictator, an aristocracy, the upper class men ruled in the Senate, and a democracy, the male Roman citizens had the right to vote. Cincinnatus was appointed dictator several times in his life. History remembers him as a great man who each time he had the total power of Rome in his hands, he left the office of dictator and returned to his farm. The Roman Empire dates from 27 BC to 410 AD. Yes, Julius Caesar and Caesar Augustus, both giants in history. But it's a Jewish rabbi from Nazareth that forever changed human history. Christianity teaches love is life itself. Christians love others because Christ first loved us. In the New Testament, we learn of Jesus, the son of Mary, who miraculously broke into human history. He began his ministry at the age of 30 with only a handful of disciples and turned the world upside down by his teachings on love, love God, and love one another. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection inspired his followers, and even some that were his persecutors, to share the good news that through the blood of Jesus, man can be forgiven of sin and enter into a new life as a child of God. While every soul won to God's kingdom is celebrated in heaven, one man's conversion brought the church out of homes and into the public places of worship we see today. Constantine, soon to be the sole emperor of Europe, was converted to Christianity after praying to Jesus and asking his help in the battle at the Milvian Bridge. He defeated his co-emperor and declared Christianity legal in the Roman Empire, huge for the church, because they had suffered centuries of violent persecution, tied to trees and lit on fire, stuffed into large animal skins and fed to lions in the Colosseum just for entertainment. But now followers of Christ were able to organize without fear and establish public churches as opposed to meeting in private homes. Also, As they designed their places of worship, they chose the architecture of the Roman legal buildings, the basilica, as opposed to the pagan temple designs. Now, the fall of Rome happened in 410 when Germanic barbarians sacked Rome. Many Romans fled to North Africa for safety. St. Augustine was the bishop of Hippo and ministered to these Roman refugees. Many Romans thought the end of the world was at hand, and some even blamed Christianity. Augustine wrote many volumes in response to pagan critics that blamed Christianity for the fall of Rome. The City of God is a tremendous literary work, and in it, Augustine compared the heavenly city of God with an imaginary earthly city. Now, Augustine is a theologian, not a philosopher like Plato or Aristotle. But there's much to be gained from studying this book. What I want you to see is the struggle between the two opposing ways of life. In the earthly city, men love themselves and love power. In the heavenly city, men love God, even to the contempt of self. So let me ask you, which city would you rather live in? Now we know a little about the major influences on the West. We'll look at a few historical highlights, starting in the Middle Ages. It's also known as the Dark Ages. 
Knowledge of this period in history is sobering, not counting the fall of creation or the exile of Israel, where the nation lost everything, even their language and calendar. This has to be the most terrifying point in human history. Rome was a military superpower, the world's largest economy, and had the highest standard of living. They had running water, paved roads, even public pay toilets, and they lost it all to invading barbarians. With nothing left to take its place, the peace and prosperity of the West came crashing in on itself. Feudalism was the governing system during the Middle Ages. Headed by a monarchy called a king and supported by landowners called lords, and at the bottom were the peasants or called serfs. They worked the land, shared the harvest, and fought as soldiers. In the year 800, Charlemagne, or Charles the Great, is really the first major political leader to emerge in this period, and the Pope, or the leader of the Christian Church, crowned him Holy Roman Emperor. This is the age of kings, knights, crusades, and cathedrals. This is Notre Dame in Paris, built from 1163 to 1345. Black Death is the other shoe to drop in this difficult period of Western history. The death toll from this horrific disease was at least one-third of the European population and could have actually been up to even 50% of the population in major cities. We see the impact on people through court documents where entire lawsuits were thrown out because everyone involved was dead and even more gruesome, plague cemeteries in every city. But we end this age with the Renaissance, the blessed rebirth of human creativity. In 1456, Gutenberg prints the first Bible, blowing the doors off the church's control of knowledge and learning. Slowly, Bibles would become printed in men's native languages so they could read for themselves the teachings of God. In 1492, Columbus sails the ocean blue. In each step of his great voyage, there were disappointments. No one wanted to sponsor his expeditions, mistakes, Columbus's calculations on the size of the ocean were based on flawed data, and even tragedy. He lost a wife, nearly lost his own life, and he had to fight to keep his earned honors upon returning to Europe. Maybe then Columbus should also be remembered for his great perseverance. In 1512, Michelangelo, a sculpture, is made famous for his painting of the Sistine Chapel at the Vatican. Michelangelo was a devout Christian and believed the Bible to be the truth revealed to man by God and studied it throughout his life. Michelangelo's paintings on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel shows the salvation of man by God. It's a magnificent work, and I do hope each of you gets the opportunity to gaze at the Old Testament as painted by Michelangelo. Now, the age of absolute monarchs or divine right kings is sometimes quickly dismissed by Americans. These kingdoms are important for our own political history because they preserved Europe's nations. A nation is a large group of people united by a shared history, culture, language, and or religion located in a particular geographic area. So think the English king over the English people and the French king over the French people. The basic idea of these governments was that God had sent his chosen to rule and the church would back the legitimate king. This worked fairly well until the Protestant Reformation in 1517 split the Christian church on October 31st into Roman Catholic and Protestant. Soon after, King Henry VIII of England decided to leave the Catholic Church so he could divorce his wife and start his own Church of England, of which he was the head. It left the people in a difficult position. Were they Catholic or Protestant? And who decides? To complicate matters even more, The English crown flipped between Catholic and Protestant, causing deadly civil war. Catholics killing Protestants, and then Protestants killing Catholics. So in 1620, pilgrims took an opportunity to sail in the Mayflower and start a colony in the New World, where they could live according to their own conscience and not according to the kings. In 1678, John Bunyan, a Protestant preacher, writes Pilgrim's Progress while in prison. He was jailed because he wouldn't conform to the government's religion. Let me tell you, if you're a Christian, don't be surprised to find yourself in jail someday. And if you haven't already read his book, it should be next on your list. And the Baroque period of the arts, about 1600. 
Art is the public relations side of how the Catholic Church battled the Protestants in their books. It's fantastic art, but the church goes baroque paying for it. Bach, Handel, and Vivaldi fill the cathedrals with beautiful music. And Bernini's sculptures? This is the interior of St. Peter's Basilica at the Vatican. Bernini's canopy is some eight stories tall. It sits above the crypt of St. Peter and below the dome of Michelangelo. To give you some perspective, the lettering on the walls around the canopy are six feet tall. And if you peek through the canopy, you'll see St. Peter's chair and Bernini's surrounding sculpture. So since you'll be at the Vatican to see the Sistine Chapel anyway, give yourself a few extra hours to spend at St. Peter's too. The Age of Enlightenment is our stopping point today. Around 1650, Western men began asking questions again. They questioned science and new discoveries, government's role in the lives of men, and even how economies should operate. The social contract is one idea many philosophers discussed. It's that men give up some of their individual liberty in order to live safely in community with others. Lots of benefits, and most of us agree it's a good deal even today. In 1690, John Locke writes two treatises of civil government, and he makes the case that men have natural rights to life, liberty, and property. More to come on this. I just wanted you to see where he is on our timeline. So while Locke is discussing the individual and society, the pastors of the Great Awakening boldly brought the word of God to the people. They preached each individual's need for salvation. Your parents' faith, or your king's faith for that matter, is not a saving faith. Jonathan Edwards' famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, is still powerful today. His congregation in the British colony of Massachusetts wasn't so enthusiastic, and he was fired even after a great many souls joined the kingdom. Church people are difficult. It's a historical fact. George Whitfield preached the three R's, that all men are ruined by sin, redeemed by Christ, and regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Most pastors in England didn't enjoy hearing his message, that even they were ruined by sin and needed to be redeemed and regenerated. So he was banned from preaching in churches. Whitfield may have been forced out, but he wasn't down. He took his preaching to the open field in England and later to the British colonies. He still holds the record for the longest horseback ride in American history, from Philadelphia to Savannah, Georgia. He was a national figure. More people saw Whitfield preach than ever saw President George Washington. Also interesting is that while preaching in Philadelphia, Benjamin Franklin conducted ex an experiment to determine if the reports of 20,000 or more attendees to one of his sermons could be accurate. He proved it was. Whitfield's preaching so moved Franklin that despite his best effort to stop himself, he dropped all of his money in the offering plate as it passed by. And we've landed this flyover of Western Civ. It's important to remember from this lesson the Jewish, Greek, and Christian influences on the development of the West. And I hope you have a new appreciation for the centuries of history that led to our own time. <music>